guys, good evening. We're going to get started uh, for to honor your time and Dr. Young's time. Uh, thank you all for being here, first of all. If you could please uh, silence your cell phones out of courtesy for Dr. Young. Got yours done? Okay. Um, this is Dr. Andy Young. He's going to visit with us tonight about stress management, uh, not only with ourselves, but with, uh, with our whole field. And, and this is what he does. He's an LCU professor. Uh, and I'm sure he'll tell you a lot more about himself. Uh, but everybody, welcome Dr. Andy Young. Thank you very much. My topic is stress management today. Uh, I guess let me start with a little background. Uh, my day job is teaching counseling at uh, LCU. Um, how do I start this? Uh, I'll I uh, mainly work on the side with the Lubbock Police Department. Uh, I do their critical incident stress management stuff when that comes up. I'm a negotiator with the uh, SWAT team that rocks. Uh, and then uh, the bulk of work that I do is victim services. We usually, uh, me and the people on my team, we usually get a call when something nasty happens. Like uh, some guy decides to blow his head off in front of his spouse. PD will call us to meet with the spouse. So uh, we end up taking a lot of death calls and trying to uh, help people after something nasty happens like that. Uh, I've been doing that since uh, summer of 2000. A lot of people ask me, how'd you get into this work with the police department and emergency services? And uh, it didn't really hit me till today that really I could blame EMS for that. So uh, I was grateful to be here just to blame EMS for this. And let me tell you why. <laughs> In the late 90s, I was minding my own business teaching a general psych class at LCU. And at the end of that general psych class, I asked the students to write a paper. And I don't even remember what the paper was about. But one of the students wrote a paper about his work as an EMS paramedic. And I looked at that and I'm like, that sounds kind of cool. I wonder if they let you know, civilians do ride-alongs with EMS. And so I asked that student after the class was over and he got a mediocre grade uh, if he'd let me ride along with him. And he said, sure. And so I got to ride along with Scott Sandifer and a couple of guys at Station 2 a long time ago. And uh, Brian Langford showed me the ropes, and I thought, you know, I could just spend the next hour telling Brian Langford stories, but I figure everybody in here has got more stories than I do, so I'll pass, pass by that opportunity. But it was riding along with EMS that uh, got me started with uh, emergency services. Uh, soon after that, the Lubbock Police Department started their victim services uh, team, and they asked me to help out with that. And in my interview, I mentioned, well, I do have a little experience in emergency services because I got to ride on the ambulance and had people puke on my boots. <laughs> that got me in. Um, so one of the things that I noticed early on, uh, watching you guys, uh, watching the police, and then with me trying to deal with victims, is there were times where I would take a call, and afterwards that call would hang on with me. Uh, I'll never forget the first suicide I ever saw. You know, I went to counselor school. Uh, they didn't really teach us about that kind of crap in counselor school, but I show up at this suicide, and this guy's sitting at his kitchen table, and he'd done one of these with a 38. You know, that's unfortunate. And you could tell that it took him a little while to uh, die because, you know, he, he put the gun down and he had all his uh, paperwork and he just kind of, eh, took him a little while to die. So anyway, I, I go into the apartment and I see this guy. I'm like, oh, I've never seen this before. What is this? And a rookie police officer is over on the phone and he sees me and he kind of that relief smile look thing and he comes over and he uh, goes, this is his daughter and hands me the phone. <laughs> And so I'm sitting there in this guy's living room, talking to his daughter about what happened, looking at him, and my mind was just kind of blown by that experience. And, uh, you know, I went home, and I wrote my report, went home, and, you know, thought I was fine. And about two days later, my wife said, what is your problem? And I looked at her, and I said, what is your problem? And realized, oh, I might have a little problem. <laughs> my, one of my first symptoms is anger, because, you know, anger is functional. But anyway... So I realized, yeah, this stuff's starting to get to me. And like I said, watching it get to other people. And I thought, well, you know, something I've got to figure out how to get, get in front of. And it was right around that time, uh, the police department wanted to start a CISM team, Critical Incident Stress Management. This was about, yeah, about the summer of 2000. And so I went to the training in Critical Incident Stress Management. We started a team at the Lubbock Police Department. We tried to get a lot of police officers trained because, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of people are a little standoffish when it comes to mental health and uh, police officers uh, very much so you know I would walk through the police department early on and walk by those police officers and I would get the psychological equivalent of <laughs> as I walk through the hall <laughs> so they were a little standoffish at first but what uh, does work is uh, training police officers to assist other police officers and training paramedics to assist other paramedics so really I just kind of had a uh, 
back seat role as uh, you know, officers talk to other officers. Like I went to a sexual assault call, and afterwards the officer said, "This is my third, you know, real sexual assault report this week." And he kind of had this look in his eye, like, "Holy crap, what's going on with me?" So you got this cumulative stress thing that you got to kind of watch out. And everybody in here knows how that goes. And then you got the real nasty ones. So going back to the uh, summer of 2000. Uh, we got our CISM team in place. We had about 40 trained officers, and uh, we did a couple of debriefings. Uh, we had the standoff in UMC ER, uh, where the uh, TDCJ prisoner took two uh, nurses hostage. That was the first debriefing I ever did, and that was on the PD side of it. I uh, never actually got access to any of the hospital staff on that one. I uh, had that debriefing. I think there was one other. And then the summer of 2001 hit. Is anybody around here summer of 2001? Okay, that was a real, that tasted like crap. That was really how I got started. We had our uh, call out at 87th in Indiana where one officer accidentally shot and killed another one on a uh, uh, SWAT call out. And so that was our, all right, let's try CISM. Problem was, uh, all the CISM trained officers in our department knew Kevin. And all of them were devastated by his death. I remember getting called down to the PD to talk to the SWAT team, and those guys didn't know me. And again, I got the psychological equivalent. And actually, I actually told me to you know, get the hell out, but you know, that, I totally understood that. Um, but really, it was just down to me because everybody else was devastated by that death. And so I'm on the phone calling the guy who taught our CISM uh, class. He was in Midland, and I said, oh, I need some help up here. And so he grabbed a couple CISM trained SWAT officers from Midland PD and a couple other guys, and they all came up to Lubbock to help us out after uh, Kevin was shot and killed. And that was my introduction to how are we going to help officers after a real nasty one. And we even had a team in place. We were still getting our policies and procedures together, but that, that was a real mess. And that was my introduction to, to this uh, trying to take care of each other after nasty calls. So since then, you know, everything's been a little different than that. There's nothing like a trial by fire to uh, get your feet under you. Um, uh, I remember some of those early debriefings with police officers. And, you know, uh, we, we get in those debriefings and we talk about a nasty call. And there'll be the guys who've been doing it for 30 years and they had, you know, all the body posture to let me know, I don't think I need to be here. And so I would tell them, you don't need to be here, but uh, your presence here might help somebody else. And so they'd usually stay. And by the end of that, those 30-year veterans would not only be talking about the call that they currently were dealing with, but then all those other calls from the last 30 years that just were kind of the splinter in their brain. And so that kind of inspired me to do my uh, doctoral dissertation on um, how to help emergency services people after a nasty call. Um, so I you know, did, did my deal for uh, getting my doctorate, and it just, it just keeps coming out that um, it's difficult for us to us, uh, I'll put me in there. It's difficult for us to take care of our own. But what I wanted to kind of present to you guys today is, here's kind of my best understanding of uh, uh, the best way to do this, a good standard of care. Uh, the first one is that point I just made. To mandate this stuff, it, it doesn't work. You don't want to mandate people to go to debriefings. You don't want to mandate people to go to counsel. You, you don't want to do that. Um, but at the same time, you want to have things in place in case people want to make use of that. The other thing that really works well is getting a lot of people trained that when, my, when I recognize that my partner, I know they've had a couple bad calls and I can see that change in behavior, I can see them emotionally withdraw or whatever, that I might have some tools to help them talk about it a little bit more than had I not been trained. So like I said, the first thing we do is try and get as many police officers trained as possible. And uh, the city offers a CISM class once or twice a year. It's free. And they'll just send out the email to me, and I'll send it out to uh, police and fire. And we'll, we'll usually get uh, 10, 10 guys from each department out there. And that's something I can do. You know, I can send that email to whoever here and say, hey, you got anybody who wants to go to this class? And the guy who teaches the class, he's a real piece of work. He was a, a district chief in Midland, uh, total spaz, uh, just totally goofy. But he does a great job of uh, presenting the material, and it's kind of funny, so that, that helps it go along, too. So trying to get other people trained, because like I said, you don't want a bunch of mental health people in there trying to help you out. It's, it's best if you guys can take care of your own, if the police officers can take care of your own. But then when the nasty one comes up, 
you know, and most people know what the nasty ones are. The day-to-day -day stuff is one thing. Like uh, the most recent debriefing that we did was this deal at uh, Fourth and Slide with the four-year-old that was murdered. Um, the holy crap. Um, there was a, there are a lot of 30-year veterans on the police department. I've been doing this for 15 years. We have seen some stuff, but that, you know, that was its own thing. And that was one of the things, you know, I started getting calls uh, when homicide detectives showed up. Like, Andy, this one, this, wow, holy crap. When you start hearing that, everyone knows we need to treat this one a little bit different. And so I got, got the ball rolling right off the bat. We're going to have to sit everybody, or, well, not have to, but offer a debriefing to everybody who wants to come so we can kind of talk this through. Because you do not want something like fourth and slide hanging around with you uh, more than it needs to. And the CISM stuff seems to help people process it a little more um, purposefully. And it seems to help people uh, to deal with that grief and deal with all that comes with a call like that uh, a little more effectively. So I get the call when all that's going on. And I send a couple of my crisis team people out there. And then when I start hearing about what it is, and I'm worried about them. And so you know we're debriefing everybody after something like that. But just to give you an example of how it works at the police department, uh, you know, Lieutenant in Homicide called me, so I, we started getting things in place. I got to call the patrol chief, uh, assistant chief over patrol at the police department and say, your guys are out on something like this. We want to try and do a debriefing on this time while they're on duty. Uh, can manpower handle something like that? And that's a real difficult thing to kind of manage. We're taking people out of service, and you know the police department really doesn't like doing that. But when it's a deal like this and your management staff has some understanding about how to take care of their people, they, they make those kind of allowances. And so we were able to uh, meet with the, uh, all the patrol officers that were there um, right at shift change at the police department. So they came on duty, but they didn't go in service for about hour and a half, two hours. And our meeting was about an hour, but we wanted to give them a little buffer of, okay, let's, let's process this, now go to work. You know, that, that's no good either. So we got all that in place. We had our debriefing. I think it was the next day in that afternoon, which is a little quick, but you know we did it. And uh, again, in that in meeting, you see the same thing. We got the young officers who are like, "Holy crap, is this what law enforcement is like?" Because if it is, I don't want to do this, and help them kind of deal with what they went through. And then we have the you know older officers and supervisors who are like, "Wow, I've never seen anything like this." And it was very normalized and very helpful for all those guys to kind of get on the same page about what what a call like fourth and slide is like. So we did that debriefing, sent them off to work, and then we have the homicide detectives. And the homicide detectives are a lot different than the patrol officers, because those guys, they, they wait around in it. They're, they're in that stuff for a while. They've got two homicide detectives, they've got to talk to that guy. And they've got to talk to that guy in a way that gets him talking about what happened. And they've got to hear all those details, and they've got all the support staff. That, so that, it's just, the, tox, the toxins just go everywhere on a call like that. So we're going around trying to do what we can to help people not let that toxin build up on them. So the next day we had a debriefing for the uh, homicide detectives, and you know everybody got around that conference table up, conference table up in homicide, and we did the deal there. And uh, the crime scene guys were there because you know they got a, they got their perspective on that thing. But there's something beneficial about getting everybody who was there together to process it together to support each other together and try and get to a place where it's a little more settled than if I had to deal with this by myself. Um, so that's what we did on a uh, deal like fourth and slide. I feel like I just said a whole bunch real quick. Any questions so far? Doing all right? Okay, cool. Sorry. Just got on auto autopilot and went. Um, uh, where to go next? So that, yeah, that's an example of doing a debriefing after fourth and slide. But we were we would not be able to do what we did in response to a call out like that if we hadn't had all this stuff in place ahead of time. And from what I understand and from what I've heard kind of secondhand, uh, this is something that's kind of been at the periphery at EMS for a while, but nothing that's really been put in place. Um, and so one of the reasons that I said yes when uh, Chad asked me to come uh, talk to you guys is, if there is anything that I can do to assist you guys with putting a program like that in place, I'd like to do that. Uh, I got guys at the fire department, guys at the police department. If you if you're kind of like everybody else, mental health, ugh, I can refer you to other people who are in emergency services who uh, who could assist you in that way as well. Um, so that's another reason I want to get 
be here was to just make that offer that if there's things that I or people on our team can do to help you out, we'd like to do that. Um, so let me go back to uh, good, good standards of practice when it comes to doing a team like this. Get your people trained, the ones that want to be trained, get them trained, have them go through the CISM classes. There's three levels of it. There's an introductory, basic, there's a, there's a group, and there's an advanced. The advanced class, um, it, yeah, uh, one of the things that they do is uh, focus on how do we talk about uh, when we have a coworker suicide? Or how do we deal with uh, situations like what we had in 2001? Kind of those specialized, these are really, really bad, nasty calls. And these are the ones that kind of affect us because it's our own people. So there's usually three levels of that training. Um, but a lot of it is giving you tools in order to help facilitate uh, other people's healing, talking, trying to decompress from callouts like that. So that's a little bit about how the training goes. Um, so if you can get everybody trained, you can kind of get a policies and procedures in place and just have that thing available as needed. The one-on-one -on -one part and then the group part. And I, I think it's about as simple as that. Uh, I've got all sorts of policy and procedure drafts, how we do at the fire, how we do at PE. Be glad to email it to you if you want to put that kind of stuff together. Um, yeah, it's relatively simple. Uh, one of the things that came up in 2001 uh, was we, had, we were getting everything in place, we were getting our policies and procedures in place, but our command staff was not educated about how to do this. So like, uh, I'll go back to one of the stories I was telling. I showed up at the PD uh, that night after Kevin was killed, and I uh, walk into this area off the uh, briefing room, and the chief of police comes and says, Andy, the SWAT team is in there. I need you to go in there and help them. Okay, I, I know enough just to know that's probably not the best way to do this. The problem is this is not the time for me to turn to the chief and say, you know, sir, Really, we don't want to do it this way. We need, we should do it. There was not the time for that. And that was the time for me to say, yes, sir, and then pray a lot as I walk from this part of the police department over this part of the police department. So I walk into that room and I sit down, and all the SWAT guys look at me, and I'm thinking, oh, God, help me not make this worse. I, uh. So I just sit there quietly or whatever. Lieutenant comes in and looks at everybody, looks at me, and goes, this guy's here to help you, and he walks out. Thanks. Great. And so I'm like, okay, here we go. I'll just make this as short as possible. And I give him like a 30 second speech and I finish. And one of the uh, supervisors looks at me and he says, Are you done? And I said, Yes, I'm done. I said, I need all non sworn personnel to exit this room. Ooh, got up and left. And that was, again, one of my first CISM interventions. Uh, I'll tell you the rest of that story. Um, that was in 2001. I started playing hockey with the cops. Uh, started doing all the other stuff I was talking about. Well, this SWAT supervisor played hockey with us, and I'm like, ooh, that's a guy. But he didn't remember me from that, which was awesome. Uh, so playing hockey with him, he and I start to be friends. And then uh, he starts, he worked uh, security at one of the movie theaters. He's like, hey, you and your wife want to come do uh, double dates with us or whatever. So we start double dating or whatever. But I'm thinking the whole time, you know, this is the guy who's like, mm -hmm. if we're going to keep dating like this, I probably need to say something to him. So. <laughs> so one day we're or one night we're at dinner. I'm thinking oh, I'm going to do it. Say, all right, uh, Chris, there's some I got to clear the air with me. Do you remember in 2001, blah blah blah? And he goes, yeah. You know, he's making that face like ah, oh, that asshole. And uh, I said, you remember the mental health professional whatever? He's like, oh yeah, I remember that. And he kind of goes, and the blood kind of rushes out of his sleeve. And he goes, oh God, Andy, what did I say? <laughs> And so we, we cleared the air and, you know, we held hands and we were all better after that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of cool to see the way things uh, got redeemed after a nasty one like that. I don't know how many people know Tracy Taylor, but he had a hard time not only on scene, but after that he had to eat a real poop sandwich for a while. But now he's back on the SWAT team. But anyway, uh, you can have those rough patches and you can have the best intentions but you really want to get stuff in place before that stuff hits. And so that's another reason I said yes to today's deal, that if you guys don't have this stuff in place, you really want to get this stuff in place, uh, not only uh, institutionally, um, but I watched guys, and we had one of these uh, probably about 10 years ago. Uh, these guys hit retirement, they turn in their paperwork, and they go home, and within a year or two, you know, uh, one I'm thinking in particular, you know, he, he just one day walked into his closet, he shot and killed himself. 
And you know, everybody knew this guy's just got a lot of barnacles on him. He doesn't talk to anybody. He carries that <coughs> stuff around. You know, we 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 did our best in that case, but you know, just trying to get in front of that kind of stuff. Uh, I guess that's kind of my appeal. That again, I'd, I'd rather get this stuff in place now than you know have some 30-year EMS veteran. Uh, get to the end of a career and go, oh, I can't take it anymore. And, 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 I, and you, I'd like to say, you know, uh, we're part of the, you know, being an EMS, we're a part of UMC. Yeah. Hospital. And they, we have a team in place. Okay, good. And so, like, the, the medics that went, the medics <laughs> went to the fourth and slide and yeah. sent to that team. Okay, good. So, but also, um, Sergeant, I think, the pastoral care at PD. Oh, yeah, uh, Owens. Owens. Well, he brought me, and um, this is something that hadn't come out yet, but we're going to try to join forces. Oh, good. On several things. Our pastoral care services, and <coughs> PD pastoral care services. So if you don't feel like going to the UMC pastoral care services or CISD team, you may go to the PD there we go. CISD team as well. So we also have an employment <coughs> assistant program. Yeah. For counseling and family members and stuff like that. Good. So we have that in place. So we want to make sure that everybody realizes those things are in place. We also need help. Being you guys have an issue, you need to approach us and help us identify that as well. Yeah. Now that fourth and slide thing, that was a no-brainer. Yeah, it makes it easy. We knew that was a problem. Right. But if you have an issue, we do have resources. There That's are good. plenty of resources there. And again, we're going to be teaming up with you guys, like Good. chili cook-offs and all kinds nice. of fun things as well. Yeah. But we want to make sure that uh, we got all, all the puzzles, the pieces of the puzzle in place. You know, that fourth and slide deal, after we did that debriefing for patrol, I was asking the guys, what about, what about EMS? And we were trying to reach out to you guys and all that kind of stuff. And I hate on a deal like that when it goes like this. And so it, I'm glad to hear we're getting, getting everything put in place. Uh, you have an in. You have a hospital uh, equivalent of what I'm talking about, um, and I'm not EMS, so you guys would have to tell me: is the hospital equivalent the same as medics talking to medics? No. Okay. No, I mean that's just that's where the that's probably where the uh, other than the chiefs and the supervisors trying to talk to mm -hmm. our team and stuff like that. That's where the little bit of the disconnect okay. is. Okay. And that's where that's where we're going to try to team up with you guys nice. as well, in order to have that more that connection of the first responder. Nice. That sort of thing. That's good. Uh, one other. This brought to mind another thing. Um, because I've been at the police department for a while, those guys have started to trust me and they know who I am. And sometimes those guys are hesitant to go to command staff or supervisors or whatever, but they still want to get some help. And so they kind of just on the sly give me a call. You know, call dispatch. They get my phone number. We put things together that way. Um, so I just put that out there. That's another way that we do business because that supervisory <coughs> command component that's real strong over at the police department. Um, but the, for those guys, you know, uh, EAP uh, is a mixed bag for them because, like I said, paramedics talking to medics, cops talking to cops. That's a lot different than than EAP. And so what we've tried to do is just put as many options out there with as <coughs> few obstacles as possible. So uh, if you don't like one way, you can do another. Oh, please, questions. All right. And it's those, those uh, in my line of work, those emotionally potent experiences that we want to take care of people uh, so that uh, that burden is not any heavier than it would be, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, yeah, anybody else questions? Or? Okay. Um, God, something you said sparked a thought. Oh, there it is. Sorry, it just takes a minute. Uh, you were talking about, you know, we got PD, we got fire, we got EMS. When all three entities work the same call, it's real easy. Everybody debrief their, themselves, and that seems to have its place. I've also found, especially doing debriefings in these smaller communities where it's not quite like that, we've got police, fire, and EMS all in the same room talking about that call. And in my experience, that's just therapeutically speaking, that's actually worked a lot better. Because when police hears the medical and hospital side, that fills in some gaps that's helpful to them, and vice versa. When EMS hears the law enforcement side, that fills in, in some gaps for them, and that just kind of helps settle the thing a little bit better. I, I know that's difficult to pull off in some places, but 
I'm glad to hear that your debriefing had all the elements in it. And with this fourth and slide deal, this is something that I was going like, you know, let, let's try and get everybody together because of the same principle. Anyway, so hopefully that will work out a little bit more. All right, what else do I need to talk about? Nice. All right. Uh, I do want to say something about cumulative stress. So we got the easy ones, the fourth and slide deals, all that kind of stuff. It's a cumulative st stress that comes and bites people in the, in the dairy air. Um, because the calls that bother me are not the calls that bother other people. So it's hard to tell just at face value, oh, that call, like my first suicide. Well, if you didn't know it was my first suicide call, you wouldn't know that I'm carrying that stuff around. And if I don't deal with that, and then I go to my first homicide call, or I went to a call where uh, I, this guy killed himself in front of his uh, daughter, a strange daughter, and uh, she wanted me to go in and get a suitcase so she could pack her stuff. She didn't want to stay at her house or whatever. Uh, so I step over him, and I'm getting her suitcase, and I look over at him, and he's staring at me, and I'm looking at him, and my first thought is all sorts of anger and expletive about what this guy did to his daughter. And I've never been uh, angry at a dead person before. I don't know about you guys, but that was just kind of a cognitively dissonant experience for me. And so you wouldn't know that I'm having all these kind of mental malfunctions about being angry at a dead guy just from, you know, jit from that call. So one other thing to be aware of, and the harder thing to catch up on, is what we call cumulative stress. The calls that bother me that you wouldn't notice are bothering me, and I got a bunch of those that pile up. Um, so I just want to put that out there. That's something that uh, the only way to get at that stuff is for uh, the person with the cumulative stretch, stress to reach out on their own. And usually what happens is they get a bad one, and then they realize they've got to take care of all the other ones. But I'd like to encourage you to, again, try and get out in front of that pitch. And if there are things that you haven't talked about, you, and you can, I got my file. You know, I, I got about ten doozies that, you know, Get me liquored up or whatever, you'll hear about them. Anyway, that was almost funny, thanks. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to mention the idea of cumulative stress as well. So how do you handle uh, uh, um, not so much drug abuse, but are being abusive with substance abuse? I mean, substance abuse, you know, it, yeah. we know it happens. You go home and you have a bunch of drinks and stuff yeah. like that, and then one thing leads to another, and then you have an issue. Yeah. How does your department handle the substance abuse? Yeah, uh, the uh, the substance abuse, the drinking stuff. Uh, I, few cases are flooding to mind as you as I consider this. Well, especially uh, interesting one at the sheriff's department that I'd love to just put out there, but I can't. So anyway, uh, but I like the way the PD and the SO have tried to handle those because they've done everything that they can to give this person the opportunity to get their stuff together prior to anything administrative, unless they just do something that's just, you know, beautifully out there and no, nobody can take it back. Uh, but, but at both agencies, uh, the assistant chiefs and I, without talking about the case itself, try and work out what's the best standard of care for this guy, how many options can we give this guy, what does the agency need to see from this guy in order for him to keep it, and just kind of all three of us work that out. <coughs> really difficult situations to work. Uh, but that's kind of been the uh, the philosophy. Let's give this person as much opportunity to get to get the ship right and headed in the right direction. Because uh, man, I, I imagine you guys have seen it too. When somebody loses their job under those circumstances, <coughs> I mean everything's already crappy. That's why we've got the substance abuse to to begin with. And then you pile on loss of a job, and so everyone is trying to do what they can to avoid that. Um, but it, uh, in in the cases I'm thinking about, the administrators. Um, they, how do I say this? I'm looking at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> the administrators have their liability and institutional concerns, um, but they have to kind of push that aside a little bit and focus on the care of the individual. And so in some part, they kind of feel like they're gambling. But my encouragement to, to them is, well, let's gamble a little bit and see what he does. And, you know, then, then, we, then it's pretty clear if, if this he or, I keep saying he, he or she wants the help or not. And then you can make your decisions from there. Um, uh, part of my job, I mean, I'm kind of right there in the middle because I got my client therapist privilege stuff or whatever. So I got to get that officer's uh, permission to talk to his bosses. And so I usually talk to the officer about, so what are we going to say to your commanders about what we're talking about? 
All of that is an effort to try and get this person as much help as possible, but also take care of the institutional requirements because, you know, we got officers and guns and all that kind of stuff. So I, I've been through it a number of times. Uh, it's hard to talk about the details, like I said, but does that give you any answer to your... Well, I just want everybody else to hear how kind of, it, you, know, you know, how you get into that. You kind of get stuck in the middle a lot of times. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you got to weigh the options of being in my sure. position, protecting the hospital, but also want the help. Right. And how difficult that is kind of in trying to make sure that yeah. we get you to the right... Help. We want to offer, I guess at UMC and EMS, we want to offer you every bit of help that we can. There you go. But there's certain lines that you cross, then we have, you know, we have yeah. to take action. Just, you know, and I guess that's part of it. There have been a number of officers who were, oh, they went across the line. And so the administrators could have said, you know, and so that's why I meant by the administrators kind of had to gamble a little bit and say, all right, can you come back to this side of the line and how do we know that we're not going to do this again? Those have been the real hard ones. Um, but I like that the uh, institutions gambled a little bit to give that person an opportunity. And in one case, it was obvious to that person and everybody else, nah, I'm going to continue sprinting <laughs> in this wrong direction. And so, hey, all right. That makes it pretty easy. Right. Yeah. Dr. Young, did you talk about a little bit about, I know everybody's different, but the signs and symptoms to kind of look for personally. Okay, so kind of personally, uh, yeah. general things and then the initial steps of, okay, how do I need to get this first to start managing myself a little bit yeah. and when, at what point do I need help? Okay. Um, I think most people are vaguely aware of their stress reactions. I mentioned I get angry. Uh, the, my loved ones are going to notice that before I do. Um, I brought a handout. If you guys are actually interested in uh, the detail, this is something that I hand out after a nasty deal. That, these are the signs to let you know this one's bothering me more than others. So it, it, it breaks down into four categor categories. We got the physical. I can't sleep, I'm fatigued, all that kind of stuff. We got the cognitive, you know, uh, I'm depressed, things are hopeless, I hate. <laughs> we got the emotional, grief, fear, sad, mad, whatever. And we got behavioral. Now, most people notice the behavioral, socially withdrawn, drinking more, uh, you know, yelling at patients. Uh, I mean, that has to happen at some level, but anyway. Uh, so those are the kind of the signs, and when you have that in the context of you know a nasty deal, then it kind of makes sense. So there's this. I brought that. Uh, the backside of this is you know ways to cope, things to try, stuff like that. Um, but there really is no substitute for sitting down with somebody who has some idea of what it's like to go through that and kind of help somebody else process their own. Um, but you can usually tell because you guys work around each other enough that, hey, this person's demeanor has changed some. Because we got the introverts, uh, and so, you know, being introvert is not, you know, that's not a stress sign, but you can kind of tell because, the, uh, because of their baseline, oh, that, you know, they're more socially withdrawn. Or all of a sudden, they're, they're really chummy today. What's wrong with them? You know, it's kind of a weird example, but anyway. So there's a few signs and symptoms. Is that kind of what you're asking? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got the real basic ones like increased sick leave. Um, their, uh, their professionalism uh, is more difficult to maintain, which makes perfect sense. Uh, I'll speak police officers. You know, dealing with all the stress of dealing with the public like that, that makes sense. But when they're more edgy than they normally would be, and again, that goes back to their baseline, then the supervisors and other guys on that squad kind of go, okay, what's going on here? And so everybody's recipe for that is different. That's, that's the hard part of answering your question. So for me, it usually starts with, you can tell that there's a change. It's going to be different, for, but most people in here will be able to tell that change. And so there's your starting place. Does that hit what you're asking? It does. Okay, cool. And how much do you think your personal life adds into your profession? <laughs> I'll speak personally. If things are crap at home, then everything else is crappier. Uh, and so it all starts with getting things squared away at home. And if everything is crap at home, then it's gonna, you're going to see it at work. And then if things go to crap at work and I get you know, five bad calls in the course of an EMS shift, all right, well, now, me, I don't get suicidal first, I get homicidal first. So I'm going I'm to kill some people, and that's going to be my stress reaction. Yeah. 
I think we all need a debriefing right now. For me? <laughs> oh, for you guys. Okay. Right. Oh, okay, good. There you go. I'm buying afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess I kind of tell you some of it. If I'm describing it pretty well, then all right. I guess I guess we're learning. So yeah, Chaz, I hit on it. Yes, that's. And then, what do you feel steps are? If you could briefly maybe touch on those steps. <coughs> um, try this first, and sure. Kind of work us through that. Uh, I I got to tell a story. Sorry. Sixty uh, third and you. This guy's got two uh, knives. He's all high on meth, and he's in a closet. And there's three officers that got him at gunpoint. And they're trying to talk him out of suicide by cop. I just happened to get there first, and so I got I got to go in the house and try to talk this guy out of the cops killing him. And I was unsuccessful. Uh, he just he wanted to die, and it just took him you know an extra ten minutes of talking to me to get up his uh, <laughs> guts to do so. So he ran at that officer. They shot and killed him. I've never seen anybody shot and killed before. I've stepped over lots of dead bodies. I've accidentally uh, kicked a skull cap once. That was awesome. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard that sound. But that's an interesting sound. But anyway, uh, but I had never seen somebody. I, I have watched this guy get shot and killed. And so that, that was a new one for me. Um, one of the most beneficial things, and you guys do this after your calls, you sit down and you write it out from a medical perspective. Here's what happens start to finish. Well, I get to write out my version of that. Here's everything that I said. I had the benefit of getting to hear the tape of that. Um, so I'm listening to what I'm saying to this guy, and I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. And, oh, I should have said that better. And then you could tell this guy, he's, he's going to do it. And in that moment where we all knew he was about to do it, I'm thinking, what could I have said? What could I have said? And I started doing that thing, you know, that second guess, and I screwed it up, whatever. And I just talked to the, uh, the California Highway Patrol guy who did all the suicide intervention on the Golden Gate Bridge, and he talked about the uh, clap to stop the countdown thing. That when you know somebody's about to jump or somebody's about to do it, you go, hey, and you yell at him, and you try and shock them out of it. And I'm thinking, oh, I should have done that. Well, I look at the tape, and I had 1.83 seconds from the time that we knew he was going to do it to when he did it to it. So I, that kind of helped me cognitively to process that and realize, hey, I couldn't have stopped it using that, that technique or whatever. So being able to process it and fill it in the gaps, if you get to hear the tape, if you get to talk to other people who are there, because getting to talk to those other officers about that perspective, that all is helpful. But man, for me to sit down and write out that report from start to finish, and not only from a medical perspective or an investigative perspective, but then for me to go home and write it out again from a, all right, I'm telling, I'm writing me a book kind of perspective. That was tremendously therapeutic for me, and that, that's what works for me, and so that, that's the first thing, that, you know, nice private, let me write that thing up and get it all out there and then read it over again, because there's something about getting it on the outside of you that makes a huge difference. <coughs> Talking does it, writing does it, whatever. Uh, then there's some just basic, the managing the stress reactions thing. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I try to fall asleep, that's when my brain engages. Uh, I remember being in graduate school on Sunday nights, I would have these, ah, because I would look at everything I had to do in the next week, and I wouldn't sleep, and it's 4 o'clock, and most people have been there. So trying to get your brain to behave, you can focus on the things that are stressful, you can focus on the nasty calls or whatever, or you can train your brain to focus on other things so I can go to sleep. Now sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. And so if you start to get out of the habit of falling asleep correctly, uh, then everything goes crappy, you know. If you're feuding with your wife and you're not sleeping, I mean, that's a great recipe for going postal, but anyway. So, instead, if I'm lying trying to fall asleep for 30 minutes, I shouldn't pound away at that thing. I need to get up, go do something else, reset the mechanism, and try and fall asleep again. So part of it is that symptom management. If you have trouble falling asleep, you got to watch out for that. Uh, the interpersonal, I mean, I'm a marriage and family therapist. We could spend the next hour talking about all that, but I won't inflict that upon you. So anyway, there's a few things, a few basic things that come to mind as far as that. Try to unwind it, but you know, I'm biased. I'm going to start with write it out and talk it out. And then being, being aware of what are your stress reaction signs. Uh, a lot of people will just kind of go through life and like, ah, I don't really, you know. But to pay attention to it and go, my mind is trying to tell me something. My body's trying to tell me something. My emotions are trying to tell me something. My behavior is trying to tell me something. And to react to that, uh, to take it seriously. You know, I got a fever. All right. My body's trying to tell me something. I'm going to react. Well, we got the same thing psychologically. How's that? 
Good. And okay. then what about managing, especially for some of the older timers in the room? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say thank you. But managing events that have happened in the past yeah. and they build on top of each other yeah. like you see with the better off. The right. Or better person. I'm biased with that stuff just because so much of my work uh, is counseling cops and combat veterans. <coughs> You know, guy goes to Iraq and he's got ten of those things that he's carrying around. That I'm biased. There is no substitute for sitting down with a competent therapist and unpacking all those things. Um, I, that there's a sure. And you know, <coughs> therapy doesn't have to be everything that they put in the uh, in the shows and all that. It doesn't have to be that stereotypical example. It can be pretty pretty straightforward, pretty about business if you get the right competent therapist doing it. Um, after Rod, uh, no, the sheriff's deputy, uh, oh, I forgot his name. Rudy. Rudy? Mm -mm. Uh, 50, uh, 82nd and MLK. Harvey. Harvey, thank you. Oh, gosh, that's horrible. After Harvey's deal, um, a lot of those guys on that squad, um, they were able to, you know, not get past it, not get over it, but they were able to cope with that pretty effectively with uh, some very specific, direct, here's how we cope with that kind of stuff. Uh, you can apply the same thing to those calls that you carry around with you from five and ten years ago. So, sorry, I'm going to give you the biased answer. Uh, talk to a good counselor. Yeah. I'm not trying to generate business. Go see somebody else. Don't come talk to me. <laughs> I suck at it. <laughs> no, kidding. All right, I've been at it for 40 minutes. Yeah, it's good. All right, I brought handouts. I'll hang around afterwards if there's anything I can do. Okay. <coughs> and I'll be taking copies of this. We'll get this to every cool. station. That way there's a copy of it on the board at every station. Uh, and once again, guys, I can't stress enough, if, you, if you're seeing these signs and symptoms and you need this help, please contact one of your supervisors. They have the means of able to get a hold of... Uh, the pastoral staff at the hospital if need be uh, and then it sounds like we're going to have other options in the future if, if we need that and that's something we can start working with okay and I'll tell you if you guys call PD dispatch and ask for me or ask for the CISM team we, we can get that going real simply it just takes a call like that you're always welcome to contact me I have his contact and we can start that process or I can give it to you myself yeah. alright anything else any questions comments have a great night. Thank you.